Welcome to this rapid review on the solo model. Uh, and we're going to focus on setting up all the key equations that we have in this model. And then we're going to, at the end, do um, a few brief calculations to illustrate how to use them. So we're building on previous discussion where we talked about how in the solo model we prefer to have everything in terms of a per worker amount. So we have, for instance, output per worker. And we denote that with, instead of a capital Y, which would be total output, we have the lowercase y you see here in the video, um, which is output per worker. And we showed in a previous discussion how you can take a production function that's for total output and you can convert it into a production function for um, based on per worker inputs to tell you per worker output. And we denoted that with this little f here. And we called it the intensive form production function. So building on that, we want to get a couple more key equations to work with in the solo model. The one we have written here that we talked about previously is basically the supply side of the economy. It tells us based on our capital per worker, we can produce a certain amount of output per worker, and that's the supply of output. Um, so naturally enough, you'd think, well, we should have some equations that talk about the demand side of the economy, and we will. So one is we have our standard accounting identity. If we were talking about total output, it would be total output is the sum of consumption plus investment plus government purchases plus, if it were an open economy, net exports. But here we're focused on a closed economy, so we can ignore net exports. And naturally enough, when we put everything in per worker terms, we still get a sort of similar equation that'll say output per worker depends on consumption per worker plus investment per worker plus government purchases per worker. And we're even going to simplify it a little more. In the basic version of the solo model, there won't be any government. There won't be any taxes or government spending. So we can sort of just cross out the GT here. That's um, equal zero in basic model. Now, there's nothing that really requires that. We might want to generalize this and add the, the government back in after we've studied the basic model. But for now, first pass, uh, it seems good to try to simplify as much as possible. All right, so our next equation, we'd like to specify something about, you know, how much do people consume? Is there some relationship that'll tell us based on their income and other variables, how much do they consume? And to make things simple at first, we're going to posit a very basic consumption function that says, essentially, consumers save a certain fraction of their income, and then everything that's left, they consume. So if they save fraction s, fraction 1 minus s would be what's left over. So s is your savings rate. And fraction 1 minus s, then, would be the fraction of output they consume. So we'd have 1 minus s times y gives you c. If your output, your total income, is y, you'd multiply that by 1 minus s to know what fraction you didn't save, and that's the fraction you're consuming. We can get a third equation, or I guess a fourth equation, but it doesn't really count as a fourth equation, by using the second and third to get what is implied basically about investment. It's implied that if you're consuming 1 minus s fraction, then you must be saving fraction s, and then you're, you're using that for investment. Because the only other possibility is if output has to sum up to consumption plus investment, all the rest must be used for investment. So we'll have investment is, or investment per worker really, is s times output per worker. So fantastic. So now we want to just check in briefly and think about what are our endogenous variables here? Endogenous variables are y, c, i, and k. And I'm not bothering with the t subscripts here because um, we, sort of, we sort of know that they're, they're around. And if you have four endogenous variables, that means typically you'd need four equations. And you might say, well, we do have four equations, so isn't that good enough? But the problem is we said the fourth one, the it, was implied by the second and third. So it doesn't really count as an extra equation. So we really need one more equation. We need one more. Uh, and that's going to be our focus in the next slide. So the, so the next equation is going to be what we called our law of motion when we studied unemployment. Remember, the bathtub model was our first dynamic model. And any time you have a dynamic model, you need a law of motion that tells you how the model evolves over time. If you're in period 0 and you want to find out how do you get to period 1, how do things change from period 0 to period 1, you need a law of motion which spells out how at least one of the variables evolves. So here the law of motion is going to be for capital. It's going to tell us how do we get capital in that next period, k, t plus 1. And the sort of it's not really an equation, but it sort of tells us how to think about the equation, is that the amount of capital next period is going to be 
whatever old capital you had, so your, your initial capital, plus any new capital you gain, minus any capital that you lose, capital that breaks or has to be divided up to other people or has to be sent to another economy. This is a closed economy, so we don't really have that possibility, but really any reason you would lose capital, you'd have to factor in. So if we wanted to put that in terms of variables, the old capital is KT. It's the capital you had in period T. Um, so that was last period from the point of view of T plus one. And then your new capital is what you get from investment. So new capital is basically IT. And then the capital that breaks, our fancy word for that is depreciation. So some fraction we're gonna say depreciates or breaks each period. So you lose fraction delta of your capital. So you lose delta times KT. And we call this delta the depreciation rate. And just like the savings rate, that'll be exogenous. We're just sort of told that. It's just a, a fact of life. All right, so this is our key equation. We can do one more modification, which is that IT on the previous slide we said is S times YT. Or since YT just depends on the production function, we could write this as S F of KT. And a lot, of the, a lot of the time that'll be preferable. It's not strictly speaking as correct um, because we could modify this, this model. We could make it so that consumption and investment are more complex functions. And then you'd wanna use that more complex function in place of IT here. But for now in the basic model, we can make that substitution. So we get KT plus one equals KT plus S times F of KT minus Delta KT. And now what we really like about this, I'm putting it in a box, what we really like about this equation is that it's pretty much all in terms of KT. If you know KT and S and delta, which are exogenous, then you can calculate KT plus one, and then knowing KT plus one, you can calculate all the values. So for instance, YT plus one, CT plus one, and so on. So let's get some practice doing that. So we'll have an example economy where the production function is K to the 0.3, uh, our savings rate is 16% and our depreciation rate is 4%. <laughs> to be realistic, it's it's probably a good sign that we have a, a pretty low depreciation rate. It would be kind of sad if, say, half your, your half your capital broke each period. So here only 4% breaks each period. And it's good we have a much larger savings rate because you'd, you'd hope that this economy is going to save a significant amount, which is going to lead to a lot of investment, which is going to help it accumulate a lot of capital. If you saw a savings rate of, say, 0.01%, 1%, then this economy probably isn't going to accumulate a lot of capital, and then it's going to be very poor, and um, I guess that would be sad. So we'll have three time periods we'll work on. Period zero, our starting period, then period one, then period two. And we could keep going forever, but it gets kind of tedious. So uh, three, three periods is probably plenty. And we can fill out a few things to start with. The first thing we're gonna need is, we have no way of knowing our initial capital. We just have to be told that. So this entry here, that's gonna go in this circle has to be given to us. It's, it's an exogenous variable. And we'll suppose for simplicity, it's one. We start out with one unit of capital, per worker. The other assumption we made on a previous slide was that there is no government spending, right? In the basic model, there's no government, there's no taxes, there's no government purchases. So the GT here is all zeros. Or you could just ignore it and say, you know, this isn't really part of the model, at least in the basic case. All right, so we don't have to deal with that column. Then the other three we can fill in based on our key equations. We said that Y is a function of K. So if we know K zero, k and period zero, we can just calculate what y will be. It'll be one to the 0 0.3, so that's one nicely enough. And then we'll save fraction 16% uh, of that and use it for investment. So investment will be 0 0.16 times y, that's 0 0.16 times one, so that's 0 0.16. And then c will be whatever's left over. It'll be one minus the savings rate, so one minus 0 0.16 times y, which is one, so that gives us 0.84. And now here's the harder part. We need to go from our values in period zero to our new values in period one. And the key equation that we've been emphasizing is the, that law of motion that we've talked about. So I put it down at the bottom. K1 is gonna be K0, so that's one, plus investment, the new capital we get, so 0 0.16 minus depreciation. That's the capital we lose, it breaks, and that's 0 0.04 times one, so that's just 0 0.04. And we get that this is then uh, 1.12, 1.12. So we can fill in that next entry in the table. 
So now we've had a chance to fill in one entry for capital next period using the law of motion, and we've had a chance to fill in one entry for each of the other variables. So what I'd like to do now is we'll just have you pause the video and go ahead and practice filling in all the other entries in the table. Uh, you should be able to do it. So I filled in the rest of the table. Hopefully these values match what you got. If not, check your calculations because the, the way we did this was just like we did earlier in the video. And I'd just like to make a few observations before wrapping up. Um, the first is that because of the investment rate exceeding the depreciation, we didn't calculate depreciation, but, it, but, but you can sort of tell that it must exceed it. Because it exceeds depreciation, we're accumulating more capital. We started with one unit per worker, then we had 1.12 units per worker, then we had 1.241 units per worker, and it seems like it's headed up. We might want to ask, well, is it headed somewhere specific? Does it head towards some steady state, like unemployment in our bathtub model? And the answer is yes. So that's the next thing we're going to investigate. The other thing is that because capital per worker is changing over time, you'll notice income is changing over time. Income is increasing. Consumption is increasing. Investment is even increasing. So we might also want to think about steady states for these variables. And uh, this steady state is really going to be the, fo the focus in using this model. It was fun to calculate all these values, but you can see it's tedious. So we mostly will focus on analyzing a steady state.